Um, good evening. Um, thank you so much um, for joining us um, for what will be a very exciting event. Um, we're welcoming it tonight. We're welcoming tonight a man who. <laughs> is very familiar to all of you um, from your screens on BBC News. Um, we'll be seeing a lot more of him in the run-up to the um, general election held later this year. Um, but it's my pleasure to announce um, political scientist and sophologist, electoral analysis analyst, John Curtis. Professor Curtis, mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us this evening. No, at all. It's nice to be here. Um, so I just wanted to start off um, beginning this interview by um, talking about the start of your career. Yeah. And it's been an extraordinary career. Um, uh, things always look much more extraordinary in reverse than they do going forward, <laughs> anyway. Um, and I just wanted to kind of start off at your time at Nuffield College. Sure. Um, which was really which incubated and um, sort of the start of your academic career. Sure. And Dr. Butler, who was um, an academic who worked very closely with um, BBC News and invented the swingometer yeah. for general elections. And um, he supervised you. And I'm just curious, yeah. how significant was the influence there? Um, important, but he wasn't the only important influence. So, basically, uh, the story is that um, more or less the first supervision I had with David as a graduate student was, I'm never going to learn how to do this stuff, but if you want to be able to study voting behaviour, you need to be able to do the stats and the computing. Um, and I spent quite a lot of time doing that, because although political science at Oxford at that stage was not particularly numerate, sociology was. And I basically went to the lectures that uh, first-year sociology graduates did, and I then went to University of Michigan and got training there. So that's a long way of saying that basically... Um, we're now back to the late 1970s. Right? My first general election in sitting in the BBC studio was 1979, which was David's last. And I was roped in because in those days, um, you know, there weren't such things as PCs, right? We're in the days of mainframe computers. This is the only form of computing that's available. You know, things that sit in large cases, in air-conditioned rooms, right? Um, and also, they weren't 100% reliable. They sometimes decided to have a coffee break, right? And... David decided he wanted me sitting behind him because one of the skills I had developed was to know how to use a programmable calculator. Back then, it's something that, that was passed you entirely by. Once upon a time, you could get calculators where you could, you, you could uh, uh, use computer programs in order to get them to do certain calculations automatically, OK? So my job was to sit there with a programmable calculator and to be able to... Uh, if the, if the num if the, when, a, when a declaration was coming in over the air, to type the numbers in and to be able to tell David instantly what the swing was, should the mainframe computer break down? Now, it has to be said, on the night, the mainframe computer never broke down. Um, but I was sitting behind him and I had access to what the mainframe computer was doing and I was, you know, occasionally trying to tell him advice. He didn't always take it. Um, but then the other, the other thing that had also happened by then is that... Um, David's principal academic output he was best known for is the, what we call the Nuffield Election Series. So it's these books called The British General Election Of, at the back of which, from 1945 onwards, which is the first one, uh, there was what was called a statistical appendix. Indeed, it was David who wrote the first statistical appendices, and he wrote the statistical appendices until 1964, when another graduate student of his at that stage at Nuffield called Michael Steed took on the task. Now, Michael was also an active member of the Liberal Party and in 1976 he became president of the Liberal Party, which is the kind of senior non-parliamentary role. At just the time when any of you who know your British history um, there were certain stories about Jeremy Thorpe, the then leader of the Liberal Party, trying to shoot somebody's dog. 
OK? If you don't know this story, I'll leave you to find out about it on Wikipedia, OK? And in the end, uh, Thorpe was forced to resign and there, and there was a, uh, a court case where basically Thorpe was uh, accused of attempted murder, but he, 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 he wasn't convicted. Um, and so Michael had said to David, I'm not going to be able to do the Cisco Appendix on my own anymore. So I was at that stage, well, you, will you work with Michael? Okay. So that, in a sense, is the reason, therefore, why then David drags me into the studio and with the program skills. But the other thing you have to know about Michael Steed, apart from being an active liberal, he was also a teledon. And in particular, he was the Economist apologist, anonymous, of course, because the Economist doesn't tell you who's authored anything. So uh, uh, Michael got me into the um, Economist and started writing for them. Um, and also, then, of course, two, a couple of years later, um, the Liberal SDP Alliance starts to emerge. And Michael being both politically interested and media savvy, we go off and we, he and I, we, do, we write up an analysis and we come up with a, a proposal as to how the Liberals and the SDP could allocate the seats between them, because they had to come to an electoral pact. That results in my first Newsnight interview, because we then, uh, this research we do gets, get, gets on air. So, so, the, so, the, so it's not just David as a supervisor drags me into an election studio, but, but uh, Michael, as the first person with whom I collaborate with academically, is also media savvy, savvy, and we start working on things that also attract media interest, right? And then there is a third person who's part of this story. So the person who used the mainframe computer at the BBC and did the forecasting for the BBC was a guy called Clive Payne, who was a computer scientist by training, who was also at Nuffield. And basically in 1981, when the first portable computers emerged, it was called a Research Machines 380Z, which came out of Oxford, you had to program it in BASIC. But we said to the BBC, if you collect all the results for the Greater London Council, we will put them into this research, research machines 3 to say, and we'll calculate for you. Change your vote share, swing, and whatever interesting patterns emerge. So that's, we then start doing local elections for the BBC in 1981. We then also do it in 1982. Um, and then we say to, the, Clive says to the BBC, you know what, if you, if we set up a link from the television studio to the Oxford University computer, which, by the way, was a 300 bits per second connection down an acoustic coupler. An acoustic coupler is where you've got a, an ordinary telephone and you shoved it into this other end and it then made you a, 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 a connection, right? Okay, this is all ancient computing. Um, the, then Curtis will sit in the studio, because by this stage David has been moved onto the radio programme, we will get him and he will do analysis of the results as they come in and give you the storylines that emerge, right? And that's how the, that's how we then did that in 1983 and then I just have basically survived as part of the BBC local European stroke general election, but for most of the time just sitting in the studio on the production side. So I am unusual and I've got a lot of experience of the production side of television, which I think is much more interesting, it's a much more powerful position. And it's only more recently that it's then also become a front of house uh, uh, role uh, as well. So basically there are three people who are responsible for my, in a sense, the television career on which I accidentally embarked between about 1979 and 1983. Right, it's fascinating to hear about the start of your career. And but the, but the, the other thing, of course, once you say about it straight away is no HR policies. Nobody said, oh, there should be a competition here for this post, right? It was, oh, we know this young chap, right? We'll give him a job. <laughs> Not quite... Um, correct for today's recruitment practices, but there we go. Uh, and it is fascinating to hear about that particular time um, in psychology and electoral analysis, but jumping to the present. Sure. In sort of a recent interview, I think it was with The Telegraph, yeah. um, you were asked, do you think 
we've got the weakest crop of mainstream political leaders at the minute yeah. in reference to Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer and Ed Davey. Yeah, and Hamza Yusuf, yeah. And Hamza Yusuf, and yeah. you said probably yes. Yeah. Do you think it's a mere coincidence that we've got the weakest ah. crop of political leaders um, coming into this upcoming election? And if it's not mere coincidence, what are the circumstances by which this trend's come about? OK. Um, so, basically, the criterion I am using is what, what the, the, the rhetorical quality of politicians mm. uh, and their ability to both craft an effective speech but also to deliver it well. And basically, if you kind of, as I can almost do, not quite, but go back to 1945 and think of all the people since then, there was at least, always at least one politician with A, a degree of charisma, B, a degree of ability to craft a speech, um, and C, a degree of hinterland as well, beyond politics. Mm. OK? Or, or, or as I would put it slightly differently, there was at least always Jeremy Thorpe, who, which, you know, whatever in the end his limitations, was a highly charismatic politician, right? And the truth is that at the moment, until the entrance of George Galloway into the House of Commons on Monday, we really do not have anybody who is charismatic. And frankly, it's quite difficult to think of people with the, uh, the degree of hinterland. I mean, in part, the 60s and 70s were unusual because you had a lot of people who had the experience of the war. So, you know, the hinterland of people like Dennis Healy and Shirley Williams uh, was in part, you know, crafted by the experience of war in the case of her, uh, case of her mother's experience of war as well. Um, but, it, but then to come on to the second part of your question, what I, it, what, what I would say is part at least of the explanation for it is that we now, our politics is now dominated ironically, much more by basically full-time professional politicians. People who, as it were, well, they go, they either read social and political science as Tripos here, or even more commonly, they read PPE at Oxford, right? And then they go off and they work for a think tank, you know, Onward or IPPR or something or other. And then they get noticed by some backbench MP and so they then become part of the, uh, the MPs staff. And of course, MPs have far more staff now than they did 40 or 50 years ago. And then, you know, their MP gets into, gets into government. And so they become special advisors. And then lo and behold, somebody says, oh, do you fancy standing for this lovely safe seat that we've got in wherever where Bloggins, who's had the seat for 30 years, is about to stand down? And so without really much contact with the art of political communication, as opposed to policy making, they find themselves an MP, right? Um, and in a sense, what I think is true of a lot of our politicians now is frankly, they should have been the civil servants, all right? What's Rishi Sunak's uh, specialism? Rishi Sunak's specialism is a spreadsheet, all right? He can, he's a policy details person. And it's true of a lot of our politicians now is that they're interested in policy making, but they're not necessarily that good at communicating more broadly. And even, I mean, and now Keir Starmer is, is different. Keir Starmer, he's into his second career. Um, but, of course, it so happens, what's Keir Starmer's career? Keir Starmer's career is as a prosecution lawyer. But pr prosecution lawyers learn to prosecute to a brief written by somebody else. They don't write their own brief. And what I'm not sure that Sir Keir Starmer has worked out is how to write his own brief, or at least to communicate that brief to a wider public. And the truth is, at the moment, you know, Sunak is... is not, um, I mean, but, but above all, also again, what they, what they cannot do, it's not just about rhetoric, it's the ability to use rhetoric to, conv to convey a vision, a sense of direction of where you want to take the country and what you are about. You know, Sunak is a details person. He doesn't have a vision that he's able to articulate. 
Um, Starmer is a prosecution lawyer. You know, he'll fill it an argument. You know, having occasionally been on the other end of it, he's a very, very good inquisitor. But he doesn't pursue his own vision. Ed Davies is a nice chap, but doesn't really make much impact. And Humza Yusuf, again, you know, he's not been able to articulate a vision in the way that Sam and, and Sturgeon uh, uh, can do. Galloway can do it in spades. He's brilliant, mm. right? Um, and, you know, he, he's going to enter a House of Commons which basically there isn't anybody there who has the same ability that he has. I mean, the person who perhaps may end up coming closest is West Streeting. I mean, West Streeting is impressive um, and does have some of these qualities, but of course he's, uh, we've yet to, 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 see, to see him at his best. And he does have a bit of a backstory uh, uh, to tell, but there are very, very few of them. Um, uh, to be honest. I mean, uh, again, that's why Boris was so brilliant. Right? You know, whatever, you know, Boris is failing. He's a brilliant campaigner, charismatic, craft people's attention, can take a message, can convey it, all right? OK. But there's nobody else who has that quality at the moment. And that leads nicely into my next question, which was in that same interview, you'd kind of referred to three titans, as you put it, of political communication, being um, Blair, Thatcher and Boris Johnson. Yeah. And it's, do you think and there's an element that's inherently speculative and counterfactual to this, do you think that that quality which you ascribed to Boris Johnson just in your previous answer would have been enough to mean that the Conservatives aren't in the catastrophic electoral straits they are now had he stayed on, at le had he stayed on as leader despite his deficiencies in terms of policy making? No, 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 look, Boris Johnson was destroyed by party gate. Right? The word that people are most likely to use now, if you say to them Boris Johnson is liar. Right? They just don't believe him. Right? And his peers, in the end, decided they could not trust him. Um, I mean, I, I mean, the, the honest truth is, I mean, I, I can remember, you know, some time before Boris became prime minister, people would, you know, just ring up and say, you know. Do you think Boris Johnson will, will, will get it or do you think people will never trust him to do it? And I said, you know what, he's probably going to get it and he's probably going to end in tears. And it's exactly what happened because he had the campaigning ability. Uh, it was his complete misfortune to be the wrong kind of person to preside over a pandemic. You needed somebody who not only could do vision, but also could command the detail. I mean, Sturgeon could do it. Sturgeon was brilliant. So Sturgeon was able to command the detail of what was going on, but then also, actually also, particularly crucially, Sturgeon could talk to people. Boris talks at people, right? Now, it's fine for campaigning. It was useless for a pandemic, and he didn't have the grasp of the detail that was required to instill confidence. Um, and so, you know, he wasn't... If he could have just been a chairman of the board, without really having to get involved in the detail, and he had around him colleagues who could, who could run the show, then he, you know, it might have been fine. But as it happened, he was thrown into a situation for which he was not adept, and then basically made a pig's ear of it, because you know, the inter you know, a, a generous interpretation is that people's understanding of the lockdown rules in 10 Downing Street were more liberal than those of anybody else. Now, in part, it was understandable in the sense that, you know, these were, frankly, one of the relatively few groups of people who were going into work every day because they had to, because they were the ones who were keeping the ships down. So you could see how they were at risk of becoming disconnected from the reality of the lives of people around them. But that's where the politician needed to have his nous. He needed to realise that this would not be acceptable. And the problem is that Boris did not realise it wasn't acceptable. You know, he's a rather sociable chap and, you know, he got sucked into the sociability that was, that was going around. Right. But then, of course, because, you know, we also know, as has long been evident, he has a relatively loose relationship with the truth. When put under pressure, about what actually happened, he wasn't up front. If he'd been up front and said, look, I'm terribly sorry, yeah, 
things happened and I should have stopped it, he might have got away with it. Mm. But of course, in the end, above all, you know, in the end, you know, it wasn't. It was Partygate provide the backdrop. But the one thing above all you do not do is you do not lie to your colleagues about what you knew about the back history of a deputy chief whip. That's a very, very Westminster perspective. But if you put in charge of discipline somebody whom you know, actually, there are doubts about their sexual behaviour, and you then effectively lie about it, you're toast. And his government, that's why his government collapsed, right? His government literally collapsed. He could no longer form an administration. Now, of course, part of the story was it was the, vengeance, it was the revenge of the Foreign Office, it was Lord MacDonald what did him, because it was Lord MacDonald who revealed that the FCO had, had, had told him as Foreign Secretary about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, Pinch's past. But in the end, no. Uh, the impact on the electorate was disastrous. I mean, I mean, the only thing to, to, thing to realise about Boris is this. Boris's great strength was he was an, he's an outcome-orientated politician. And in a sense, during the pandemic for a while, that bit worked because nobody really cared about how the PPE was acquired so long as the PPE was acquired, which is why that story has never really got that far. Nobody really was worried about the fact that basically we engaged in some pretty dubious public procurement practices because we basically bought up every vaccine that might possibly exist in the hope that one of them would work. But nobody objected to that because, you know, particularly people of my age, we wanted the, we wanted the vaccine to get our lives back, all right? That was all fine. So, and indeed, for at least half the country, Basically, uh, breaking the law on prorogation was fine because at least it was for a cause that half the country believed in, which was to leave the European Union. But the moment he tried to rescue Owen Patterson's career, um, because Patterson had been found to have broken the rules on lobbying, there is no constituency out there of people who feel that we should make lives easy for MPs who have second jobs. There's no constituency for that. So the moment that Boris breaks the rules or tries to bend the rules for a cause that nobody believes in, then he was, began to be in trouble. And then within a matter of weeks thereafter, there was no constituency out there that said it's fine for, it, for 10 Downing Street to have a party when I could not see my partner with dementia in the care home or I could not go to my brother's funeral because there were two, that would uh, max out the number of people who could be in the funeral, et cetera, et cetera. There was no constituency for that. And the emotional resonance of Partygate is incredibly strong and people have not forgotten. So no, I mean, basically Boris, Boris's style of government worked for so long as he was pursuing Causes that some people thought were to be noble, and you could argue it was a, it, there were advantages to that style of government in the pandemic. Um, his, 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 uh, uh, you know, he's basically somebody who wants to achieve things, doesn't really care about constitutional conventions or rules of the game. You know, he's a player, not a gentleman, to use a very old fashioned uh, cricketing analogy. Um, but it was always a weakness in terms of his ability to actually manage the pandemic, because he couldn't manage the detail. And it certainly then came a cropper when we discovered that he just wasn't on top of the 10 Downing Street operation, which was always going to be a problem and proved to be his, his, his undoing, so far as the public is concerned, in the wake of party game. Mm. So, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's a flawed genius. It, it's just like a Greek tragedy, right? You could just write it, you know. Act five was... Tell lies to, or uh, not to be honest with your MPs about one of the about the, about the sexual behaviour of one of the the people you put in charge of discipline. You know, you just couldn't believe it. Mm. And it's one, I've got one or two more questions before I open it up to the floor, as I know sort of many of you um, will have a lot of thoughts about sort of the sub substance of the discussion so far. But you emphasised the role of Partygate yeah. and the role of Boris Johnson's downfall. Yeah. Looking at Partygate through a broader lens, do you think Partygate now is still more, respon is more responsible for the Conservatives' um, lack of support in the polls than 
anything that Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have done since, has, how much does it still resonate, mediated through the events of the past two years? Right, OK, the, the, the answer to is, if you want to understand why the Labour Party is nearly 20 points ahead in the opinion polls, you just need four words. Boris Johnson, Liz Truss. So, basically, the history of this parliament is, and this is now very, very difficult to remember, for the first two years, all the way through to December 2021, when the first stories about Partygate emerged, the Conservative Party was never, ever consistently behind the Labour Party in the opinion polls. This was one of the best records of incumbent governments, certainly since the 1960s. Incumbent governments tended not to be unpopular in the late 40s and in the 50s, but from the 60s onward, incumbent governments have nearly always got into electoral trouble in mid-term. This government did not. But then, basically, with the emergence of Partygate, the Conservative Party lost six points in six weeks, and for the first time they fell behind the Labour Party in the polls. And then the Conservative Party, when Boris Johnson's government eventually collapsed, he elected Liz Truss as successor, and the wake of the Liz Truss fiscal event, the Conservative Party lost another six points in six weeks. And that's the end of the story. And we are basically still now where we were at the back end of October, 19, October 2022. The, only, the, the, the piece of evidence I will give you, however, as to why Partygate still matters is that actually the Conservative Party was beginning to make some progress under Sunak's premiership in eroding Labour's lead. They got themselves up to the high 20s in the opinion polls, up from 25%. And then they failed to vote as a party, including above all Sunak, failed to vote for the Privileges Committee report that said that Boris Johnson had misled the House of Commons. And all the progress that the Conservative Party had made since October uh, 2022 went out the window, literally. You can put exactly the day on which the House of Commons had its vote, support for the Conservative Party fell back again. Um, so they failed to... Di so, of course, you know, the problem is the difference between the perspective of the party and the perspective of the broader electorate. There are still people inside the Conservative Party who think Boris Johnson is man from heaven, but that's not the view of the electorate. Sunak really seriously badly needed to, to, do, to uh, create clear blue water between him and Boris. He failed to do so, and he's still, he's still paying the price. Mm. And a lot of food for thought as we move to our audience questions. So, um, yes, just there. Uh, how, how is the... Um, thanks. Um, how likely do you think Labour's current poll lead is to reflect the uh, um, actual election outcome, particularly given the, num the, the number of undecided voters? Um, the number of undecided voters varies quite substantially from one poll to another because quite a lot of opinion polls actually squeeze the undecided voters. Uh, so that, that's point one, but those polls still end up with large Conservative leads. Two... Um, the, um, it's quite difficult to compare the position with the past because virtually nobody is polling in the same way as they did uh, before. But you can do the comparison for Ipsos back to 2010 and basically before the 2010 election. It was true that uh, 2005 Labour voters were rather more likely to say don't know than were 2005 Conservative voters, and the gap between them is more or less the same as the gap up present in Ipsos's polls between, in the level of don't knows between 2019 Conservative voters and 2019 Labour voters. The don't knows did not rescue the Labour Party in 2010. Third point I would make is this, is the don't knows are a symptom, they're not necessarily a remedy. If you actually look at the things that... Um, the views of don't, of don't knows. Don't knows, like those who have defected from the Conservative Party, are A, deeply unhappy about the state of the economy, and B, deeply upset about the state of the health service. So the things that have pushed people all the way from Conservative to Labour or Conservative to Reform, which are primarily those two issues, are also the things that have pushed people from Conservative to don't know. So the Conservative Party is probably... The, the don't knows are probably the group who are most likely to go back, 
but they're not going to go back automatically. They're going to have to be won over because they have the same grumbles as those people who've gone all the way to another party. And the last point I would make is this. I well remember between 2010 and 2015, the Liberal Democrats saying, it's all right, it doesn't matter. Mo a lot of our folks saying, don't know, they'll come back. They didn't. So the they don't know, if they're going to come back, they're the group who are most likely to come back. They're not guaranteed to come back. They will have to be won over. Otherwise, enough of them will go wandering off to other parties or just stay at home, because I expect we could have a low turnout in the general election, that um, it won't rest the Conservative Party. There's no guarantee that um, uh, uh, things will narrow. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. They did narrow... Um, before, I mean, the, the analogy we're all looking at now is 92 to 97. They, di they didn't narrow between now and the calling of the election in 1997. They did narrow during the election campaign, but only because the Liberal Democrats took, seats off, took votes off Labour. The Conservative vote increased by one point in the election campaign of 1997. So there is no guarantee that there will be a Conservative recovery. Um, they will have to uh, make progress. And, and the, the problem they face is that they have so far... I mean, actually now, if you take the average of the, the polls this uh, the, the month just gone, they're actually in a slightly worse position than they were after the Trust fiscal event. They, they slipped to 24%. 24 um, and basically, Sunak has, failed, Sunak has failed to make any significant progress in uh, eroding or erasing the memory of Liz Truss, and time is beginning to run out. So maybe the, things will get better, but things are beginning to get a bit desperate. Mm. Um, just um, there at the front. Thank you. So, linking literally just onto that question, yeah. if we don't see Labour, you know, recovering the economy and recovering the NHS, do you think we could see the undecided voters perhaps go to Reform UK in 2029? And do you think they could possibly win a decent share of seats in 2029? A very, a very good question. Um, I, I mean, I mean, to cut a long story short, basically, as I suggested, we are essentially are where we are primarily because of the mistakes made by the Conservative Party, or slightly more charitably, the Conservatives haven't been, been dealt a really rotten hand, but they're making a good mess up of it, all right? Um, it's relatively little to do with what, with, with, with I mean, with the, with the exception of the Labour Party now being regarded as much more moderate than it was under Corbyn, but most of the other objectives that Keir Starmer set out for his party have not been achieved. It's not reconnected with the working class. It's only had marginal impact in terms of reconnecting with Leave voters, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, basically, Sakir is a very, very lucky leader of, of, of the opposition. It does, the risk therefore is the Labour Party in not having in a sense sealed the deal. People in a sense, well, oh, surely to God it can't be any worse. Surely these guys can make things better. And in particular, and we're getting, you know, tomorrow is potentially an important part of this story. The Labour Party, as before 1997, not willing to say we're in, willing to increase taxes not willing to divorce himself from the Conservative Party in this basis, but doing so now against what will be a much... You know, the Labour Party in 97 had a very easy fiscal position, a very, very difficult fiscal position. And the risk the Labour Party are taking is that the honest truth is, given that the, the fiscal uh, forecasts are pretty much fiction, because they assume levels of cuts to public spending that it, we don't think can be delivered, that basically the next government is going to... Although we've increased the tax... or already increased taxes very substantially, the next government is probably going to have to increase rates of, rates of, rates of, rates of tax. And the problem is that if you've kind of gone into the election, which is... Well, this is the mistake the Tories made in 1992. The Tories crucified 
the Labour Party united to, to on claiming that they were going to increase taxes. Then when the Tories got into government, they increased taxes and they got crucified in 1997. The Labour Party are in risk of making the same mistake. And I think, I mean, I would argue the Labour Party has more um, room for manoeuvre than it realises and that it should be thinking about using for that room for manoeuvre, perhaps indeed taking the risk that maybe they get a somewhat smaller overall majority, but have positioned themselves in such a way that the risk of disappointment setting in fairly rapidly after the next election is at least to some extent limited because you've been, more, you've been honest with people about the task that faces you. And I'm not sure the Labour Party have had the courage to be honest with people about the challenge that will face them. That will come back to that. Now, who profits? Who knows? It could just be the Conservative Party if the Conservative Party doesn't implode. It could be the Liberal Democrats because, you know, they're, they're what's left. But yes, it could also be, you know, who knows who's, who's going to manage to, to profit in those circumstances. You know, all of the above are potential beneficiaries if indeed we end up with a Labour government that indeed increases taxes, contrary to what it was saying in the election campaign, isn't able to turn around the health service very rapidly, um, and disenchantment sets in fairly quickly. And the economy doesn't take off either. So, yes, yes, you've had your hand up um, quite a while. Uh, hello, uh, I'm a very big like, nerdy stats fan, so this is a boring polling question. But if you cast your mind back like eight or nine years ago, yeah. there were a lot of what we're seeing in the media as significant polling failures. For example, with the 2015 election, some people saw Brexit as a polling failure, though I kind of disagree, and then 2017. Do you think the polling industry has been able to recover from this and learn from their mistakes? Um, particularly with the development of new methodologies like MRP, or do you reckon we're still back in the same thing, place we were 10 years ago? Um, the, prop, the, the thing that led to the downfall, well, at least one of the things that contributed to the downfall of the polls in 2015, that risk is still with us. Um, so the, 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 the answer to why the polls were wrong in 2015 is really, really boring. It's the most obvious answer, but it's the last answer that anybody wishes to come to. They just had too many Labour voters in their polls, right? But why did they have too many Labour voters in their polls? Well, at least part of the explanation is that there is now a very, very strong relationship between age and how people vote. And this is a relatively recent development. So, you know, it used to be that class is the basis of British politics, all else is embellishment detail. Class is no longer a dividing line. Age is the crucial dividing line. Young people vote Labour, older people vote Conservative. But one thing that hasn't changed is that younger people are less likely to turn out and vote. And one thing that polls find it more difficult to do is to get people who aren't going to vote to participate in their polls. Now, you might think that doesn't matter because you're only interested in the people who are going to vote. But the trouble is, if you then weight your data so that what you've got is the proportion of young people in your, in your sample or the proportion of people who are in the electorate, the people you've interviewed are indeed young people who go out to the polls and vote Labour. It's just that they're not representative of their peers. A lot of them don't, so you therefore end up with too many Labour voters in your polls. So that's the problem in 2015. Then in 2017, what the polls did is they tried to correct the, uh, for that problem by weighting and adjusting their polls in various ways, and they ended up over-egging the pudding, and so they underestimated Labour's position. So in 2019, they basically went back to what they were doing, although along the way, the polls have tried to do more some of them at least, to try and get more people to participate in their polls who are not going to turn out and vote. That problem is still with us. That said, even if the polls make the kind of error that they did in 1992 or in 2015, given the Labour Party are 20 points ahead, Labour are still going to win the election, right? So... Um, and there's no guarantee they will do. I don't, I, MRP, by the way, isn't, is, isn't an answer to the problem. MRP is dependent, is dependent on the quality of the data that's collected and therefore faces 
exactly the same challenges. The only thing I would say to you is that Brexit, it shouldn't be on your litany. A majority of the polls that were conducted during the, the, the EU referendum campaign said that Leave were ahead. It, and it, indeed, virtually all the polls a week before polling day said that Leave were ahead. It's just that the polls moved back some of them towards Remain, and then people said, ah, oh, it's all right, we know what's going to happen. We always knew it was going to happen. People are frit, they're, go they're, they're, they're afraid of uh, uh, going away from the status quo. People have swung back, and they interpreted this as what was going to happen. Actually, two of the six polls that were published still had leave ahead. The only honest thing that you knew that the polls told you is, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. So I don't think 2016 was a, was a fundamental failure in the way that 2015 or 2017 arguably were, but for different reasons. Um, I have to say, I'm hoping a lady is going to ask a question and we've got 15 minutes left. Yes, just there. Excellent. I expect in an institution like this that the woman to be at least as voluble as the men, if not more so. OK, um, so I know that you're, you know, you're pretty certain that Labour are going to win the election, but do you think, like, with their kind of constant U-turning on like, the pledges that Keir Starmer was elected on, they have a risk of isolating like, their loyal voter base, that targeting those don't-know voters might kind of limit their majority or loyalty for future or just the next election in general? I mean... The answer to you is that, so far, there isn't any evidence to suggest that that, that is what is happening. Um, I mean, it's certainly true that there's a lot of disquiet within Labour's ranks about the position in Gaza. Um, and, you know, that does now play into our domestic politics because, I mean, mo most people, both Conservative and Labour voters, either say, if you ask them which side do they support in the Middle East, they either say both equally or don't know. So a lot of people go, oh my God, right? Or, oh, you know, or Allah or whatever, right? But amongst those who do take a view, in the case of Conservative supporters, they primarily support Israel. And in terms of Labour supporters, they primarily support um, Palestine. And that group has grown in the course of recent weeks. So nearly half of Labour voters now say that they, that they have more sympathy with the Palestinians than the Israeli. And of course, Sakir has been desperate, desperate to reconnect with the Jewish community and to, to uh, uh, stem the charge of anti-Semitism. And he now finds himself in a difficult place because he's having to bridge a Muslim community which, which, you know, in the end is about 4.5% of the UK population as opposed to a Jewish population which is, a half, which is about a half percent of the population. So he finds himself in a difficult place now. Um, but there, now, beyond the immediate circumstances of Rochdale and George Galloway, whom we know is capable of articulating the concerns of the Muslim community, he's done it twice before, it's not clear that anybody else will have that ability. And that most of the, even if there are Palestinian candidates and they take some votes away from Labour, you know, most of the seats with large Muslim communities are very safe Labour seats. So it's not going, going to make a difference. I mean, but again, but you know, what is interesting is look at what Labour have done in terms of, you know, the, the, the 23 or 28 billion quid, what it was they were going to spend on green investment, which was meant to be their central platform for, um, promoting the economy. Now, there was a weakness in that. The weakness in that is they still hadn't worked out half of what they were going to spend half the money on. So it was a bit half-baked, but what have they cut? They have cut home insulation. What is the most popular net zero policy? It is to subsidise the ability of all of us to insulate our homes. And so again, thinking a longer run beyond the election, they have ditched a policy that might actually help to make next zero, which again, fundamental existential challenge that will face the next government, and the next government you know, may be in charge until more, almost 2030, by which time we need to have got our emissions you know, seriously down. It's just junk. The one thing that might help to take the electorate with it, 
on this issue. So, you know, you can see, and, you know, equally also, um, you know, more broadly behind all of that, you know, one of the ways in which, you know, uh, public expenditure is meant to be got down at the moment is by cutting public sector investment. It's not obvious that this is the answer to an economy that is struggling with low, with, 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 with low, with, uh, low productivity and which is also needs to adapt uh, the character of the economy away from carbon uh, to a non-carbon economy. So, you know, you can certainly see again, it's the thinking ahead of what are the challenges you're going to face in government. That's where I think where Labour are not necessarily thinking ahead, as I suggested earlier, as opposed to is it going to make a difference now? I mean, to be honest, at the moment at least, you know, I mean, we are talking about an electorate which is deeply pessimistic, deeply disenchanted with the state of the public services and just hoping that somebody can fix it. But not necessarily convinced that Labour can fix it, but at the moment at least Labour is the stick that they can use to beat the incumbent government. That's roughly where we're at. And that isn't a terribly stable foundation for uh, a long-term government popularity. Just there. I was just wondering how you think the Greens will do in the election. Um, we've got a target of four for 24. Um, we're often squeezed during generals, especially compared to locals. And do you think our performance will be hampered by the fact that we're underrepresented on radio and TV, especially compared to smaller parties or similar sized parties like Reform? Yeah, I noticed last night that um, our new club, which I only watched briefly because I was on the sleeper and wanted to go to go to sleep um, that reform were present in the panel of politicians and the greens were not now if you take current polling position you can if you take representation inside the house of commons you can argue i mean so it depends i think you have to decide whether the glass is half full or half empty um, greens are running consistently at about five or six percent that is their best consistent polling average in any previous parliament um, Clearly, you have worked out that you that you need to be able to focus on particular places. So it's what Suffolk. There's now a bit of a bit of strength. There's Bristol, where there's long been a bit of bit of strength. On the other hand, you've got to try to hang on to Caroline Lucas's seat, and that won't be straightforward. Um, so I, mean, I think there is a risk that the Green Party might put in its best performance in terms of votes, but not necessarily uh, get any representation. I assume the Greens, that, I mean, there's going to be no deals this time like there were in 2019. So it'll be interesting to see whether the Greens actually manage to fight every seat or not, which they've never quite managed to, uh, to do before, at least south of the border. Um, the, you're right, the risk is that they will get squeezed by Labour, which is where it's at least some of, the, insofar as Labour are losing votes, where they've lost votes too. And equally, you know, whether the Conservative Party will, will squeeze reform when push comes to shove is the other issue. Yeah, that's the challenge. Um, on the other hand, um, concern about climate change is relatively high. Now, you know, it's also true that lots of people are concerned about the personal cost of climate change and there is in a sense there, there's a debate that we're still not really having about who pays for climate change do we make it a collective cost or do we make it an individual cost and we've not really had a debate i'm not sure where the greens stand on that if i were the greens i would be arguing that basically the state should be taking on a significant part of the burden quote unquote um, because if you can persuade people that you can regulate industry, regulate the market, change the infrastructure so that people and, and, can, and, and will make it possible for them to get the heat pump and to improve their insulation, then, then I think you're potentially onto a winner. But that's the way in which you've got to approach it. Um, you're going to have to make it acceptable to people. Uh, it's not the hair shirt. Oh my God, we've got to change it. We've got to change the character of our lives because of the carbon economy. It's a question of, for most people, they'll buy into a net zero economy if it means they can still more or less do what they currently do. Or to put it slightly differently, could please somebody change? how the things that we consume are produced so that we can be virtuous. 
That's the challenge, because that's where basically the public are at. Um, yes, just there. You've had your hand up a while. Um, I thought I'd just ask a question about the United States, if that's OK. Because you can try. I don't claim to be an expert on the US. But there's a lot of controversy about the polling in the US at the moment. Obviously, for the first time in eight years, Trump has a consistent national poll lead of about two points, about yeah. four or five points in the key states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. Sure. Um, Democratic advocates seem quite puzzled by this, because in the real world, in, for example, the midterm elections, Democrats have done quite well holding on to key battleground seats. So, do you think there's a possibility of a poll error in the Democrats' favour this time, or do you think we should just accept at the moment that Trump has a pretty solid lead, if you consider the polling evidence? Yeah, the problem, of course, is that the error that the, the polls are thought to have made in 2020 is to underestimate Trump more than to overestimate him. So, um, I, I'm, I mean, in the end, well, it turns on two things. Assuming that Biden is still the candidate and Trump is still the candidate. One is, do in the end people assuage their doubts about Biden's age? And that's partly about Kamala Harris. And secondly, do those, do, uh, on the other side, is um, do non-Republicans, are they willing to some of them vote for Trump, despite his somewhat dubious current legal position. Because, I mean, it, it isn't just Republicans uh, identifiers who are saying they're going to vote for Trump. Uh, independents are, at the moment, more likely to say they're going to vote Trump than Biden. And Biden desperately needs to win that group back. Um, and then I guess the other thing it will turn on is whether or not Biden can convince people that the economy is not doing so badly after all. I mean, the US economy is in a much better state than ours. On the other hand, um, you know, inflation, gas prices in particular have gone up. And, you know, the problem with inflation is that you can say to people, well, you, you know, your inflation is not so bad as the inflation elsewhere. It's the inflation that you face that people are, fi are, are, are fixated on. Um, so claiming some of the credit for the relative strength of the US economy will also be important. And, you know, these are all big unknowns. Because we are talking about a society in the end that's, you know, is ideologically divided down the middle. So it's who can get the relatively marginal advantage, and that's still uncertain. But, you know, Biden's got, Biden's got a chance, there's no doubt about it. I think we have time for one or two more audience questions. Um, just, just there. Yes, you've had your hand up a while. What do you think the influence of uh, like social media has been on the rhetoric of politicians, um, both when they're communicating out of the House and in the House of Commons? Thank you. I say, first of all, I'm not an expert on social media. One. Two. Finally, thankfully, the law has been changed. And now social media is at least subject to similar regulation to um, print media which is you've got to say printed and published by, and you can already see some of this in social media that's going out. Um, now, of course, it can still be possible for people to claim things that are printed and published by people, but then at least you are, you are, you are committing a criminal offence if you can ever find out who was responsible for the bot that did it. Um, otherwise, I would say, I mean, when I did research in this area, which is quite a while ago, um, basically, the evidence was social media is quite good for mobilising your base, but not necessarily particularly good at persuading people. Because, of course, what it does tend to do, it, does tend, it tends to create virtual communities of like-minded folk, which therefore reinforce e each other. And that's why you can get some of the um, quite intense, you know, debates that tap people's emotions, like Brexit or transgender or whatever, you can get some really quite uh, vitriolic debates, um, but um, whether or not it changes very many people's minds is another matter. Now, of course, the concern is that, you know, AI makes it possible to produce fake material more easily and well, whether or not this will persuade people. Now, of course, nothing new about fake. You know, remember this is an OVF letter of 1924? It's just it provides another way of 
engaging in, 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 in old tricks. And, you know, I mean, you know, those Liberal Democrat famous leaflets are saying only the Liberal Democrats can win here with bar charts that, shall we say, you know, tend, tend, tend to defy the law of graphics. Misinformation is not new in our democracy. Uh, it's just that we, you know, it just takes on a new, new dimension. But whether we are more exposed... No, I mean, I think, I mean, in part, my view tends to be what's true about... What we now see on social media are the lies and misinformation that were always told but one to another in the, in, in, in the, uh, duck, and, uh, the duck and pond, right? I mean... Don't, don't come away to the idea that before social media, there was a virtuous electorate out there that was nice to politicians and said, oh, that nice chap, Howard Wilson, or oh, that lovely Edward Heath, aren't they fantastic? No, they said, you know, Edward, Howard Wilson is a charlatan and, and Edward Heath is trying to screw the miners. All right? They weren't necessarily... But the point is, you didn't have the, you didn't have the digital trace. You couldn't see this being said. Now we have a digital trace and people go, oh, my God. People express these politically incorrect views. And, of course, we've also become much more politically correct as a society. Therefore, we go shock horror. Well, you know, once upon a time, as we still remember, remember the signs outside flat, no, no, no Irish, etc., etc. Just there. Um, you suggested earlier that maybe Labour hasn't necessarily solved the long-term problems that came to fruition in 2019, and that obviously Keir Starmer's been very lucky. Yeah. And you also mentioned about um, Wes Street, and you gave us an example of someone who has a bit more vision. Yeah. Who else on the Labour front bench, or doesn't have to be on the front bench, who else in the Labour Party do you think might be someone to watch for the future, someone who might be more successful. I've told you who to watch. It's Wes Treating. Wes Treating. Yeah, and it so happens that I, I happened to bump into a journalist um, this afternoon who completely independently um, articulated exactly the same view. Right. It's just... I mean, his weakness is he doesn't, he's not very strong in the union movement. He's got a lot of work to do in that... Uh, work to do in that, uh, to do in that direction. Um, but um, he's the one person who... I mean, he's a very, very impressive media performer. Um, much more impressive than uh, any of his colleagues, including, by the way, Rachel Rees. You know, I mean, Rachel's a you know, clever economist, but um, she's not particularly effective as a... Certainly as an opposition spokesperson. Um, streeting... You know, Streeting's one of those people... You know, criticism just goes off like a like or a water off a duck's back. He's just an incredibly well-oiled uh, speaker who can just always deflect anything with an effective response. Very, very good, and be very, very valuable in government. And I suppose to kind of round it off. And this is a question which I think is applied more narrowly to Labour, but brings in a holistically a lot of what you're saying, is that it seems that from sort of party gates to various bits of misinformation, that a lot of what determines voters' outcomes isn't necessarily ideological. Absolutely. Well, and it depends. You see, right, the 2019 election was an election about ideology. 80% of the public voted for parties whose views about Brexit aligned with their own views about Brexit. And indeed, in the Scottish Parliament election of 2021, the figure is close to 90%. Around 90% of people voted for parties whose views on whether Scotland should or should not be an independent country aligned with their own views. The 2023 four election is going to be what we call the trade of valence election. It's essentially driven by handing of the economy, handing of the health service and the ethics and competence of leadership. Those are the issues. And I think what I was going to ask is kind of looking back to kind of Labour's past. Yeah. And Ed, do you think that this argument that Keir Starmer's adopted that Labour needs to adopt the centre ground to win, do you think that that's sort of a fundamental tenet of 
British politics that at least within kind of the contemporary or foreseeable British political future no, remains Boris, immutable. Boris Johnson did not go for the centre ground and he won handsomely. So could you see a more adept left-wing leader than Jeremy Corbyn, almost a Corbynite, someone with Wes Streeting's face, yeah. Corbynite economics, I mean, but, could they but, capture the country? But, but I mean, look, Jeremy Corbyn had two striking weaknesses. Weakness number one in 2019, and, and this, is, this is one of the great ironies. In 2019, Jeremy Corbyn was the last compromiser standing. This so-called ideologue was the one person who still wanted to bridge the Brexit divide. So he says, you can have a referendum, trying to appeal to the Remain side, but I'm not going to tell you what I would, what I, w I will not ever give you a recommendation as to how to vote, trying to appeal to the Leave side. He was the one person left not taking sides. And it made him look weak and ineffective, right? That was his problem, right? Number one. Problem number two was that Corbyn was, was not able to make... So Cor problem with the, the Corbynites is that they thought that the ideology was about policy detail. And so they had lots of policy detail. Some of it, by the way, not so stupid as it, as it seemed. So what do they want to do? They wanted to nationalise the railways. What have we done? We've effectively nationalised the railways. Oh, what was the other daft Corbyn idea? It was that we should make sure everybody has access to broadband. Three months later, we, the government was handing out iPads to people who didn't have connections because of the lockdown. All right? Actually, quite a lot of what Corbyn talked about was, was, was sensible. But what he couldn't do is he couldn't make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. It's back to the vision thing. Corbyn could not give people a sense of what it was he was trying to do. And I, I remember the moment that it wasn't working. I remember Annalise Dodds was doing um, the, 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 the week at Westminster. And I said, Annalise, what's the Labour Party, what, you know, what, what's the Labour Party about in one word? You know, what's the equivalent of, of take back control or, or get Brexit done? It was, oh, we want to get better public services. And I knew at that moment they'd lost it. Right? They couldn't articulate the vision that underlay a set of policies that actually weren't that radical. But of course, Corbyn, and again, Cor Corbyn, of course, I mean, Corbyn's other weakness is he, 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 didn't, he didn't understand how people saw him. And so if you take, I mean, that the first attempt of the Conservative Party to play to his image was, you remember as soon as he became leader, he was, I don't know what it was, he was at some service rather, I think mm. it, it was a remembrance, it, was, it wasn't Remembrance Day, but it was something similar, all mm. right? And Corbyn, the, 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 the cameras were on Corbyn, and you know, he clearly wasn't saying anything or singing anything or whatever it was, all right, okay. And he was attacked by Tory MPs. Now, what Corbyn should have done at that point is he, what he should have said was, how dare you criticise how I was acknowledging whatever it is this, this service was about, I've now forgotten, right? In other words, to turn it back on them and argue that they were, being, they were the ones who were being disrespectful of the service that he was attending. But he wasn't clever enough to do that, right? Because he wasn't able to say, I need now to take the stance of my opponents and to turn it back on them and to criticise them for failing to be true to their own values. Because if he had done that early on and had deflected the criticism and said, actually, you guys are going for me, but you are being disrespectful, it's you that actually are not being true to your values, he might, might then have been able to deflect some of the criticism. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we have Boris against Corbyn. Corbyn, who was ineffective, and who was, yeah, relatively, who was, who was, who was an ideologue. But he was, his opponent was an ideologue too. It was Boris. 
Though Boris's ideology, of course, was not traditional Tory. He was an ideologue on Brexit. Actually, in other respects, Boris was, very, was, was uh, in terms of in, in, uh, being an in, interventionist, was you know, not a traditional Tory at all. But he certainly had strong views in some of these areas. Well, I think that's a fascinating place to end it for this evening. Um, thank you so much to everyone who so actively contributed. We covered, I think, quite a lot of ground. We did, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, Fantastic. Could we please have one last round of applause for Sir John Curtis? Just as a brief reminder, we've got our debate on Thursday. This House believes modern technology will destroy liberal democracy. So please do come along for that. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. Okay.